Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, that's okay. So we'll just talk loud. That's going out the other direction. My name is John Morstead. I'm the Executive Director of Finance and Operations with Osseo Area Schools. Uh, considering the recent security events in schools across the country and close to home, we feel it's important to take this opportunity to inform our students, staff, and community members about the practices in place in our schools in the area of safety and emergency management. Safety and emergency management is truly a team effort. We are very fortunate at Osseo to have a dedicated team of safety professionals, as well as outstanding community partnerships to help us maintain a safe school environment. I'd like to introduce a member of our team, Troy Schreifels, the Director of Transportation, Facility Operations and Risk Management, and Troy will be kicking off our presentation this evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Troy Schreifels. Thanks, John, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I'd like to welcome our board members, our superintendent, our members of cabinet, and our community members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share some insight into what we uh, do to make schools safe. Tonight, the community will gain an understanding of the district's overall security and emergency management practices and protocols. And at the end, we'll have a little open house where we will to give you an opportunity to connect with our team and with our community partners um, to share insight and questions that you may have. With that, I'd like to introduce um, a couple of our um, staff and community members. I'm going to start with our community partners. Um, with us tonight, we have our Maple Grove partners, um, John Wetterlock, who is over in the corner there. Um, John, sorry, John, is, our, is a commander with Maple Grove PD. Um, and then we have uh, Sergeant Andy Sandberg. And then we have Detective Missy Parker, who is a Maple Grove um, SRO that works in our Osseo Senior High um, area. And then I'd also like to acknowledge um, uh, Chief, uh, Police Chief Warner, who is not able to attend tonight, but is one of our um, partners as well that works very closely with our organization. And then also Heidi Nelson, who's a city administrator with the city of Maple Grove that works very closely with our organization. With that, I'd also like to introduce our Brooklyn Park team that we partner with very closely. Tonight in attendance, we have uh, Sergeant Nick Knobloch and Detective Joe Magana, who is a Brooklyn Park SRO and also works at our ALC. Um, and then with that, I'd like to introduce uh, my team. Um, on to my right, I have Dave Mordock, who is um, our Assistant Director of Risk Management. Dave has spent uh, the past six years and has worked um, in the security management field for over 13 years. Previously, Dave was an officer for 10 years. Uh, Dave is a board certified, he's board certified in security management and a certified protection professional through the ASIS International um, Certified in Emergency Management, through the State of Minnesota, the Department of Homeland and Emergency Management, as well of, as a member of the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. In his spare time, I think you uh, like soccer as well, right? Okay, because there's a lot going on there with him. Emily Kane is our Risk Management Specialist. Emily came to us from the district, in, or she came to us in this district in January. Prior to that, Emily was a police officer in Brooklyn Park for 14 years. The last seven years, uh, Emily served our district as a detective in the juvenile unit and as an SRO, not our district, but Brooklyn Park PD, and then our district as an SRO at Park Center Senior High. While an SRO, Emily served on our uh, Risk and Emergency Management Committee and also on our Threat Assessment Committee. The slide I'm sharing with you tonight is a slide that cut, or is information that comes from FEMA. It's emergency management style. We are looking to continuously improve how we prepare, we prevent, prepare, and respond and recover from emergencies. Prevention is the process of putting, uh, protect, uh, putting protective play in place to reduce the likelihood of disasters occurring 
or to reduce the impact of something occurring. Preparedness encompasses activities, programs, and systems developed and implemented prior to an incident used to support and enhance prevention. And, and lastly, res, uh, response deals with executing the plan and performing duties and services to preserve and protect life and property. Recovery ensures that processes, resources, and capabilities of the organization and reestablishes to meet ongoing operational requirements. So when we think of our operational cycle, all of these things are incorporated in the practices that we do here at Osseria Schools. A couple of the other responsibilities that we're uh, responsible in this department that we'll share with you tonight and you'll get some more information on. Um, we have emergency response plans for all of our schools and for our system. We'll talk a little bit about our drills and our training and what we do with our staff. We'll talk a little bit about our physical security, like camera systems, uh, card access systems, intrusion systems, two-way radio systems, Raptor visitor management systems, and then another big area will be behavior threat assessments. We also have our Speak Up tip line. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll also talk about our partnerships with the communities with SRO and our DARE programs. And then we'll also talk about our site vulnerability assessments. Next, I'll turn it over to Dave and Emily, who will share more information on the district security and emergency management components. Thank you, Troy. Good evening. The message I have tonight is our schools are safe. School is one of the safest places students and staff will be during the day. Why is this? Because of the emphasis we have placed on creating safe and secure spaces. Tonight, I will inform you of three things we currently do to ensure our schools are a safe place to learn, work, and visit. First is our emergency plans. We will have emergency incidents in the district, but when we do, we activate our plans and take action to ensure the safety of our students, staff, and visitors. Second is our physical security. You will hear this term several times during the presentation. Physical security are the tools we use to protect people and our facilities from a security incident. Last but most important are people. These components, these components are intertwined and do not work independent of each other. Each component relies on the success of the other to ensure a holistic approach to security and emergency management to be successful. We will next discuss each one of the components in further detail, starting with our emergency plans. The district's emergency response plan follows the National Incident Command System and Incident Command Structure as outlined by FEMA. This means our plans are systematically aligned with our local, state, and federal first responders. Essentially, we use the same command structure and we all speak the same language. Our emergency plans take an all-hazard approach in which we determine what threats we have to our schools and then des design plans to mitigate, prepare, and respond and recover from such hazards. One size doesn't fit all. We have over 30 locations that have varying needs, so the plans are site-specific to take into account the uniqueness of each location. We have parallel plans for out-of-school time. We have plans for evening and weekend activities as well as summer programming. We also have a reunification plan. Reunification is the process of reuniting students with their families if they must evacuate their school during an emergency. The district is also a sister district to the Monticello School District. This plan is sponsored by the Homeland Security and Emergency Management in the event of a radiological event at the Monticello Nuclear Plant, in which the Monticello School District would be transported to a designated school in the district and families would be reunited with their students. All of our emergency plans are digital. Gone are the days when a building principal needed to maintain and carry around a large string ring binder with all of our plans and maps when there was an emergency. Today, the entire district response plan and maps can all be accessed from an app on a telephone. When a school has an emergency, the building occupants will almost always be the first responders for the first three to six minutes while awaiting the arrival of police and fire. For that reason, each location has an identified incident commander to lead a building through the initial minutes of an emergency. The incident commander is typically the building principal or an alternative if they're out of the building. Other members of the building crisis response team are used in support roles to assist the incident commander. Buildings are also supported at the district level 
that provides assistance to the sites during an emergency. Schools are not on an island during an emergency, and there's a whole team of staff at the district to support and provide resources. Each department in the district has one or two designees that are alerted through our district cr crisis communication tool. This tool allows all departments to come together when there is an emergency to share information and determine the resources necessary to return the school back to normal operations. Unified Command is an important component of large-scale emergencies. If we have an emergency and Unified Command was established, the district would have a representative at the table with our police, fire, and EMS partners. This partnership allows all organizations to make informed decisions on a, how to best respond and recover from an emergency. Each school is required to complete 11 emergency drills per school year. Our staff and students are well trained. An incoming freshman to one of our high schools this school year has already completed 45 evacuation and 45 lockdown drills during their school career. In addition to these drills, we ask staff to think about different scenarios throughout their workday. For example, if I was outside during recess and the school went into lockdown, where would I take my students to be safe? In Osseo, a lockdown means that there is a concern inside the school and anyone outside should not enter. So as a staff member outside with students, I need to determine the capability of my students. A kindergartner is much different than a fifth grader. Do I have students with mobility issues? What areas are nearby that seem safe? A park, a residential area, a church? If I can think about emergency situations in advance and how I might respond, this will help me determine a course of action in an actual event. I do not need to live in fear, but instead have a plan to be prepared. The district has trained staff on the run, hide, fight protocol for active threat situations. Though it's important to know what to do in an active threat, our goal in the district is to prevent an active threat, threat situation from occurring in the first place. One of the best tools to prevent an active threat incident is a behavior threat assessment program. Those thinking about targeted violence are most often members of our community signaling that they need help. If we know what to look for, we can see the signals and intervene. The Risk Management Department operates the Dis District Behavior Threat Assessment Program in partnership with site leadership. Depending on the level of concern, Risk Management will, facil uh, excuse me, will facilitate an assessment with a multidisciplinary team at the site to assess the threat and to implement a safety plan to ensure the safety of staff, students, with an appropriate individualized safety management plan to mitigate identified risks. I'll now turn it over to Emily. Hello everyone. As we go through the physical security systems and technology, we'll start out as someone comes to one of our buildings, either as a visitor or a staff member. As someone arrives at one of our schools, they will not have immediate access to the building. When they enter the front door area, they will have to push the intercom button. Then they will be greeted by front office staff via the intercom to establish a person's reason for being at the school. If the person needs to enter the office area, the button must be pushed by staff to allow entry. If they do not need to enter the front office area, then they may be asked to wait in the vestibule. Once a person enters the front office during the school day, they will utilize the Raptor Visitor Management System. When doing so, they are having their identification cross-checked with the National Sex Offender Database, as well as a custom list for the site and school district. If there is an alert on a person, staff are trained on how to respond to those alerts. The system also provides staff with an accountability list for who is in the building in case of an emergency. Visitor stickers are printed and should be placed on clothing to be worn in the building. Another way for staff to get into the building is our card access system. We use a card access system on roughly two-thirds of our exterior doors in the district. This allows us to control and to account for staff entering our facilities without compromising overall security. We don't have to issue exterior keys to all staff, which would be very costly if one is lost and a school needed to be keyed. So by either coming into the front office or entering another door, we know who's coming in. In conclusion, everyone in our building should either be wearing their staff ID or a visitor identification sticker. Panic fobs are strategically located for staff to push in case of an emergency. 
The panic fobs feature a silent notification to 911, alerting local law enforcement that there is an emergency at that location. There are also lockdown buttons placed in our buildings for easy access. The lockdown button is an internal way of notifying staff that there is a lockdown situation. The lockdown button activates a blue strobe light inside and outside of the building and in some schools will play a continual message for people inside the building. The blue strobe light on the outside of the building indicates that the school is not safe and that you should not approach. In a true emergency situation where 911 needs to be notified and the lockdown button pushed, we encourage staff to push both of these buttons at the same time if they can safely do so. We have an enterprise level camera system. This is a very large undertaking and requires constant maintenance and updating of the technology. But this is a necessary safety measure at our schools and the cameras are used throughout all hours of the day. And communication is vital in an emergency situation. Two-way radios allow staff to communicate instantly with key personnel inside and outside the building to coordinate a response. We are in the beginning phases of transitioning our sites from an aging analog radio system to a new state-of-the-art digital radio system. Four of our district schools will make this conversion during the upcoming school year. We also use other tools to help keep our schools safe. A locked door is our number one security feature in the district. We know that this is a large concern of our community members in light of recent events. All of our exterior doors are locked except for the front entry door to the vestibules of our schools. But again, visitors are stopped by a locked door they must request access to. While we know staff and students utilize the doors during the day, the doors are back locked and remain locked after they are closed. We have a added security window film to some glass in key identified areas. Lighting offers safe and secure buildings by providing safe walkways, parking lots, and athletic areas. A well-lit area is a safer place. We have intrusion alarms for after hours to notify the police in case of motion or activity when no one should be present. Fire alarms are essential in a quick evacuation of a building in case of smoke or fire. Public address systems in each school are utilized by staff and site leaders during emergencies. This is used to alert staff of a response protocol, evacuation, shelter in place, lockdown, or severe weather shelter. During these situations, it's imperative that the whole school gets the same message of what is happening and the expectations during that time. And an HVAC shutdown button is utilized if there is an air quality problem and we do not want the circulation taking place. And that sums up the physical security systems. I'll turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Emily. Um, as we wrap up talking about our physical security, the tools that we use to keep our building safe, uh, it's important to note in November, the Security and Emergency Management Department has partnered with I2T2, our technology department, on a referendum for school safety and security technology. This funding is critical to continue our comprehensive safety and security plan uh, for the district. This referendum would allow us to continue to replace and upgrade our aging analog two-way radio system to a new secure digital radio system. It would all also allow us to maintain and replace our digital camera system, those servers that are used to operate it, our visitor management system, key card system, intrusion system, and maintain vital software that we use in the department. We currently have $10 million in physical security needs over the next 10 years to maintain and improve our safety and security technology. In addition, we are seeking additional funds for improving main entrance security at Maple Grove Senior and Osseo Senior in the future. And the last component that I'd like to speak about tonight are people. People are the most important component of our security and emergency management initiative. People often ask how many people work in security and emergency management department in the district. I'm quick to answer, over 3,500 employees. Every employee of the district plays a vital role in keeping our schools safe. That is 3,500 sets of eyes, ears that can deter, detect, and delay an incident in one of our schools. It's a staff person that ensures a perimeter door is closed and locked to prevent unwanted individuals from gaining access. It's a staff person that greets and welcomes individuals using our secure entry system. It's a staff person that notices and reports an adult in a school building without a visitor or ID badge. 
It's a staff person that reports suspicious or concerning behaviors to administrators that may result in a behavior threat assessment. It's a staff person that initiates our plans and it's numerous staff that ensure the safety of our students during an emergency. Most important, it is staff that show kindness and compassion to our students. From a bus driver greeting a student in the morning to a nutrition services staff providing the only hot meal some of our students receive each day to the teacher that encourages a student to be their best self. It is staff that make the difference. A few years ago, we held a Q&A session with high school students at a REMAC meeting. We posed the question, where do you feel the most safe during the school day? Almost all the students stated they felt most safe in a classroom where a teacher knew their name and cared about them. A practice in the security and emergency management department is to have most of our security initiatives go through the district's risk and emergency management advisory committee. The purpose of REMAC is to continuously improve and support the execution of our district risk and emergency response plan in order to ensure safe and healthy learning environments in Osseo area schools. When we think about our safety in our schools, it's important for us to get input from a diverse perspective of people and roles in the district. Members come from all levels and departments. Currently, we have principals, assistant principals, teachers, ESPs, union leadership. We also have members representing our law enforcement partners, as well as community members. In the last two years, we've had students uh, be a part of our REMAC committee. We started REMAC in the 2016-17 school year, and one of our first topics was how to balance warm and welcoming in a safe and secure environment. Out of these meetings, we developed a plan to implement a secure entry system at all K-12 school locations in the district that have now been in place since the 2019-2020 school year. What you see before you is the summary of the six REMAC meetings we held this past school year. We held a Q&A session with our SROs and their supervisors to learn more about the district SRO program and their purpose. In January, we reviewed and discussed how district responds to threats. You may recall, there were a rash of social media threats to school in December, nationwide, and in our community. This resulted in training for frontline staff on how to report threats. Next, we discussed how to improve our response to emergencies, particularly those that were infrequent. We also reviewed our staff all hazard guide and made recommendations for improvement. This has resulted in a new emergency take action guide designed to be clear, concise, and to drive action from staff and students when an emergency occurs. In March, we reviewed the ISD 287 school shooting to determine key takeaways for improvement, which included increased staff training. Since the beginning of August through the start of the school year, Emily and I will be conducting over 40 training sessions on security and emergency management. Training ranges from understanding the roles of a building crisis response team to front office staff physical security training to emergency management overview training during teacher workshop week to run height fight refreshers. This is just an example of the work we are doing currently, but our goal is to offer training throughout the school year to keep safe and secure schools at the forefront. Are you interested in learning more about security and emergency management in the district? Would you like a voice when it comes to district security and emergency management? We are actively recruiting staff, community members, and high school students to be on REMAC this school year. REMAC meets virtually five times a year on Wednesdays from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. And our first meeting this school year is on October 5th. Applications to join REMAC can be found on the district website under advisory groups, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. I'll now turn it back over to Emily. We have established great connections with the police departments in our communities, as you see some in the crowd. And those relationships pay dividends to prevent, respond, and recover from emergencies. We have a total of 10 school resource officers in the district split evenly between Brooklyn Park and Maple Grove Police Departments. Each secondary school has at least one SRO. Park Center has two and Osseo has two, but one of these officers flexes to other sites as needed. It is worth noting that all of our SROs are detectives. When we have a threat or concern in one of our schools, we already have a team of detectives that have developed relationships with students and staff and have been able to quickly determine if a threat is credible or not. By investigating these threats throughout thoroughly but in a timely manner, 
We are able to keep students in class and not disrupt learning. We meet monthly with our SROs and their supervisors and bi-monthly with police and city leadership to share information. Our schools are microcosms of our communities and what affects one usually affects the other. An example of a great partnership occurred toward the end of last school year. There was a police situation just over 200 yards from the front door of one of our elementary schools. We received a call from the SRO sergeant advising us of a police situation and to place the school in a shelter in place. We then activated our police activity shelter in place plan. We brought in all students and staff, locked the main entrance, verified all other doors were secure and did not let anyone in or out all while continuing learning from inside the school. The sergeant kept us updated during the situation, streamlined through our emergency communication alert system, and also coordinated police officers to, pre to be present for a controlled release of students at the end of the school day to their caregivers on the back side of school and away from the incident. In this situation, staff took action, but we also benefited from the positive relationship we have with our police partners. And this past school year, the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office expanded their SHIELD program to include schools. Hennepin County SHIELD is a public-private partnership to share information, and the new school partnership brings together school security personnel from all over the metro and not just Hennepin County. As mentioned before, what's happening in our schools and our communities is most likely occurring in those around us. And having relationships with neighboring districts and communities only benefits us. We already have a meeting scheduled in the beginning of the school year to begin our collaboration. Now I'll briefly go over our speak up tip line. Students and staff are positioned, are best positioned to identify and report concerning behaviors of their classmates. We encourage students to report these behaviors to trusted adults at school or if they prefer to remain anonymous, they can report the information to the district speak up tip line. Anyone can report a tip to the Speak Up tip line by either leaving a voicemail or by completing an online submission form that be, can be found at the bottom of any district website. As part of a REMAC recommendation, this spring I worked on rebranding the tip line and ensured we had flyers posted in all of our schools. Our secondary schools were provided with flyers branded to their colors and mascots. Those flyers were placed in common areas where students gather to provide them with the QR code or phone number to report anything concerning. In our ele elementary schools, they were placed in our front entryways. Now I'll hand it over to Troy. Thanks, Dave and Emily. Um, thank you, everyone. This will conclude our presentation. At this time, I want to do a couple of housekeeping um, comments. We are now going to open this up to an open house style where we are, we're going to be able to present and be available for questions. There's a couple of ways you can do that. We will, you know, mingle around the tables and answer questions you might have about some of the stuff you learned tonight or other questions you may have brought with you this evening. If that is uh, not the uh, avenue you want to take, there's a couple different ways to connect with us. One way is through... Our lovely QR code on the screen, you can scan it with your phone if you'd like. And it's a nice little survey. You can submit your questions, and they'll come to our department, and we'll review those and respond to you very quickly on that. If you don't have that available to you, we have a handful of Chromebooks that are set up with the survey there. You're more than welcome to take a seat and fill out the information there and leave it with us, and we will, again, connect with you that way. With that, we'll conclude the presentation. I do have community partners, as we mentioned earlier, that are available too if you want to learn anything regarding our SRO program. We have all our members of Cabinet here as well. So we'll open it up and that will end this presentation. So thank you. <laughs>